Okay, this is um, Digital Systems Design, um, the third lecture, and this is for Friday, uh, the uh, 28th of August. Um, so let me just start, we'll take a quick look at the syllabus like I usually do. Um, let me shrink this down and I will put this down here. I might use, I might switch to a slightly different one. Maybe, maybe that's what I'll do. So I'll get rid of this and I'll do this and I'll change cameras and we'll switch to this and then we'll go down here. There we go. All right. And then we'll pull up our syllabus. All right. So uh, here is our syllabus and I'm going to go to where we get our schedule. And so here we are on the uh, 28th and we're, uh, we're working on chapter two. The prereq test, um, I have not uh, put that on Blackboard yet. Uh, I will hopefully get that done um, sometime um, uh, Friday. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to today and hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to do it online in the next uh, over the weekend or early next week. Um, uh, I guess I'll try and get everybody to get it done by say Tuesday or, or Monday or Wednesday of next week and uh, I'll put that on there but I have to provide it for you to do first which I understand and I'll try and do that uh, the problem is I, I didn't go into the office today and I, I thought I had it on my jump drive but I don't I guess I have it on the computer at work so and if I don't have it on the computer at work I'm really in trouble because I'm gonna have to write it all over from scratch and so, and for, it's really just for ABIT purposes, but, I, but we like to use the exact same questions, uh, although I may not even be able to do that because it's going to be online. So we'll just see. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. Um, so that's what we're going to do. I did go through and I got all the, uh, all the laboratories, which we have listed down here. So I, I, in the lab, all the due dates are correct now. And it turns out there is, there is a little turn-in sheet for lab one, which you can turn in. Uh, a week from um, uh, this Saturday uh, at midnight and it's, I, I don't think there's very much to it so um, but just fill that out and turn it in and that, and that will give you credit for lab one um, if you already got credit from Alex that's fine then uh, but I'd still like you to turn that in uh, more more than anything just kind of for practice and that's how we'll do all the labs uh, the the for some of the other labs though I will want you to submit a video showing that you're um, that your board actually works uh, and, and executes the code. Uh, but for lab one, we'll probably let that slide. Okay. Um, I think that's that for that. All right. Let me, um, I think that's really it. Uh, if you didn't get a board yet, I will be available at, at 10 o'clock Friday. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know if I'll be in the atrium. Where we're, where we're going to be selling Viva boards to the Micro One students, or if I'll be in the, the lab on the second floor where we'll have the Micro One students working on soldering their boards, but or, or if I'll be in, sometimes in my office, I'll be around. So just if you need a board, track me down. I will be office, atrium, or, la, or uh, in the engineering building in the lab, one of those three things. So um, I, you should you will definitely be able to find me someplace, and we still have, we have plenty of boards, so... Uh, uh, come on in and get your board picked up. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Let me start over with uh, where we were then. Um, we'll pick up where we left off. All right. So um, so this is, uh, and I'm gonna sh I'm gonna shrink. Uh, I'm gonna put myself down here so you can still see me, but not too much. Something like that. Okay. I think that'll work. All right. So Verilog modules. So this is the this is the um, this is the basic structure of all uh, Verilog programs. There there is always a top level module, and in that top level module, uh, that that top level module has the port list that connects to the real world. So you can always uh, you can always see what's going on uh, by looking at that top level module, uh, and uh, I'm kind of rambling here. 
So the top level, so you will always have the top level module in your program. You hopefully or probably will have a lot of other modules too. Uh, and, and your top level module will likely call a good number of other modules, some of whom will call other modules. Just like in C, you can never define a module within a module. Modules must be defined separately. Uh, so normally the way you write things is you write your top level module and then after your top level module at the end of it you have an end module statement. The green are the keywords here. Uh, and then uh, after that then you have your next module which will be essentially a sub module. And the, the port list of that module will be will appear in your top level module. So the port list of those signals will not appear to the outside world. It'll only appear where it's instantiated in your top level module or if it's called by a, a, a module, a, another sub module, then, uh, then, uh, then the signals will appear to that sub module. So the whole concept of doing modules is the signals that go in and out of a module. Let, let, me, let, me, let me switch to my um, let me switch to this. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I see. That's that. Okay. So let me. Let me. I know that didn't work. Okay. And then let me switch cameras. I'm going to go over here and, and draw a little picture. Okay. So. So the whole idea of these modules is, okay, the whole idea of the modules is that you have a top level module. This is your top module. And then that module uh, may very well call another module. In fact, it may call a whole bunch of modules. And then some of these may call other modules that may call a whole bunch of other modules. So this will be module, this will be top module, this will be module A and B and C. And then B may be called uh, D and D may be called uh, E and F and G. So, so you can see your top level module can call A, B and C and then B may call D, and D may be called E, F, and G. All of these modules, though, will just be defined in a, in a, in a straight line through your program. Top module first, then A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F, then G. But the way they're called will depend on how they're called. But only, only the top level module, the port list from this, from the top level module, will be visible to the outside world. Which means, in our case, the pins on your FPGA. So this module will address the pins on the FPGA. If these other modules need to address those pins, they will do it through this module. So you can pass the pin from the top level module that connects to one of your actual out output pins on your FPGA or, or an input. And, and you can pass that to A, and A can do something to it. But A does not talk directly to the outside world. It only talks through the top level module to the outside world. And um, the other thing you have to remember is that all these things are operating simultaneously all the time. This is the hardest concept to get used to uh, in HDLs, be, to realize that, that you're You'd, it's not like a computer program where you're doing step one, step two, step three, but you are, you are doing all these things all the time. And because you're doing all these things all the time, then uh, that's why it can get a little screwy. Uh, and you can, you can definitely get yourself in trouble by having module B and C at the same time affecting the same variable. That doesn't work. And, uh, and so that's what you have to be careful with. And the only reason, the only way to learn this is to actually do it and experience that problem and realize you have to deal with it and correct it. Uh, 
that's why you must write Verilog code, program a device, and see if it works. It is impossible to learn in any other way uh, because these practical lessons of what works and what doesn't work, just they don't make sense until you get slapped in the face with it not working and have to figure out why. Okay, so anyway, uh, back to the slides. So let me switch the camera back to me. And I will shrink this down. Okay, so anyway, so uh, so takeaway point, three, three takeaway points. First is the entire structure of a very long uh, program uh, that defines your hardware is made up of modules with one and only one top level module that defines all of the communication with the outside world. In the case of an FPGA, that's all the communication with the pins on that chip. No other module directly talks to any of those pins. It must go through the top level module. Now, one of the questions that actually, when I first started doing this, took me a long time to figure out is uh, where, how does the, uh, how does the, the how does Vivado know whether uh, any particular pin is an output or an input. And it turns out it's not in the, it's not in the constraint file. The constraint file just define, identifies what, pin you, what physical pin the port list of the top level module is talking to. But whether that pin is an input or an output is defined in, in, the, in, the, list of, in, the, in the port list at the beginning of the module. So if you look at this structure here, so you have the keyword module, all lowercase. Then you have the module name. It doesn't have to be lowercase, but it is case sensitive. And then you have a parenthesis, and you have the module interface list. And there are, a, it, again, just the, very typical for Verilog, there are always multiple ways to do everything. This is one of the, this is another one of the really confusing things about Verilog. Because there's so many different ways to do everything, uh, you inevitably, get confused about whether you're doing it the right way or the wrong way. But um, there are several different ways of doing this. And once you get exposed to several different ways, you can pick your own and then you should stick with it. What I prefer, what I like to do, is I like to put all the signals in parentheses. And then I go down here and I list, uh, list all the inputs and list all the outputs. And, and if they're bi-directional signals, I list those. And, and this is where the the Vivado knows learns whether these various pins are going to be inputs or outputs. It's kind of interesting. So it, it comes from these lists right here. So it's very important that you specify which ones are inputs and which ones are outputs. Once you get through defining these things, then you put the guts of the module down here where it's going to describe how the signals are processed and and oftentimes you, the, the next thing you do is you define a whole bunch of internal signals that are used within the module but have no visibility to the outside world. And again, this is a, another important concept of modularity. We have signals in, every, in any module, they're, they're the signals in the port list. For the top level module, these are the signals that talk to the outside world. But for all the other modules, these are the signals that the calling module uh, can send in and get back from the module that's called. But a module should be built so that the only signals in the, that, that the only the signals that need to come in and go out of the module are in the port list. As much as you can, you want to put any internal signals hidden inside the module so that no other module can interfere with them directly. And, uh, and this is just a way of isolating the function of each module from other modules so modules aren't interacting in weird ways. Remember, all, all your Verilog statements, uh, certainly all the assigned statements in any module are always executing all the time. And uh, always blocks are a little different. They do execute on clock edges, but uh, the, rest, the rest of the stuff can execute all the time. So you really have to remember that in say module B, you don't change, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a signal called variable A three or something, and at the same time you have variable A three being changed in another module. That will get you into trouble. 
and uh, and usually it gets flagged, but not always. Um, all right. So this is the general structure, and uh, here's an example of a module with two gates. Now, obviously, this wouldn't be a very complicated system, but this is this is the idea. So uh, the syntax is what's important here. So first of all, uh, we start off with module. That's the keyword. Then the name of the module is two underscore gates, no spaces allowed. Then, uh, then you have uh, A, B, C, D, E. So those are the signals. Now, at this point, you don't know whether A is an input or an output or whatever. Now, down here, you have the list. And also, we don't know which ones are wires and which ones are registers either. If you don't specify them as registers, then they are automatically defined as wires. So, uh, so in this case, since there were no registers specified, they're all defined as wires. Um, so the output is E. Okay, so that means E is an output. And A, B, and D are inputs. And then you have this wire C, which is an internal signal. Now this one is specified as a wire. These uh, could have been specified as wires, uh, but by leaving the wire off, they're automatically specified as wires and not registers. Um, if you wanted to be registers, you have to specify register. It's a little early for you to worry about that. Just keep in the back of your mind that we're going to have wires and we're going to have registers, and you're going to have to learn very specifically which ones need to be which. It, it turns out that's real important, but it's so confusing at first that you just have to ignore it for a while, and uh, and then you'll begin to catch on. And even then, you'll probably make a, make a bunch of mistakes. I mean, that's fine. Um, that's why you're in school learning this. All right. Now here we have two assigned statements. Assign C equals A, logically ended with B. Logical because it's two ampersands and not one. Had it been only a single ampersand, that would have been bitwise. Now since these were not specified as vectors, and you remember if we go back, we specify arrays and uh, vectors. These are uh, double arrays, but obviously uh, when we just have uh, single arrays, uh, well, I don't know, I, anyway, we'll go on. Uh, so if these if these had been uh, vectors, then they would have been multiple bits. But since they're not vectors, they're single bits. And if they're single bits, the logical operator and the bitwise operator work exactly the same way. But if they're vectors, that's not true. That 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 very much changes things. And almost all the time, if you're using vectors, you want to use the bitwise operators and not the logical operators. So my practice. And again, I, th these slides that were made by the the authors of the book. Uh, I I would never use logical operators in this case because uh, it might confuse me. Uh, but since they're single bits, it will be fine. You should really only use logical operators where you really want a logical result, as opposed to um, where you uh, where you sorry where you want a. Um, a bitwise result. Okay, so anyway, same thing here, logical or, but it works just like a bitwise R because C and D are single bits. All right, the way these assigned statement works again, doesn't matter the order in which they appear, but anytime a signal on the right, so the signals on the right for this assigned statement are A and B, the signals on the right for this statement are C and D. Anytime these signals change on the right, it's, it recomputes the left hand signal. Now, in an assigned statement, the left hand signals must be uh, wires. They cannot be registers. They must be wires. So in other words, these over here can't be flip-flops. They just have to be a wire connected going someplace. Uh, in this case, we don't know where the wire is going. Well, it's going to the, it's connecting to the outside world. Uh, and, and so just remember, in an assignment statement, the left-hand side must be wires. And it cannot be a register. Okay, and then you have the end module. Double slash, and you have uh, comments over here. All right, so this is what you made. You made a black box with three inputs, A, B, and D, and one output, E, and an internal signal, C, that does not appear to the outside world which is why it's declared here. All right, now we also have here, um, well, this is the black box view, okay. 
So now we have A, B, and D and an output E. And this is how you should think. You, your module should pr present itself to whoever's going to use it, whatever code's going to use it, just like this, so that, that nobody but this module has to think about what's going on inside here. And the things you want other people to mess with are going to be signals that go in and out of the port list. But any internal signal should be hidden away. And uh, that's, that's how to think about this. Okay, so the, um, yeah. So again, m keyword module, module name, list of signals, and then you describe which ones are outputs, which ones are inputs. Then you describe all the internal signals, um, and then you describe the function uh, of the module itself, what, what's actually going inside the module, and then end module. All right. Um, Okay, so the the port list can can have three different types of signals: strictly inputs, strictly outputs, and signals that can be bidirectional. This bidirectional designation can get complicated, and we will eventually mess with it. But for the time being, we're going to kind of put this aside and come back to it when we uh, are kind of forced to use it. But an example of an input and output: let's say you had a read-only memory. Uh, you would have uh, you would have the output from the ROM, but if you want to program the ROM, those data lines then are the way you input data into the ROM. So those would those would generally be listed as in out signals, and not outputs. Even though they're most of the time function as outputs, but sometimes they are used as inputs, so they'd have to be called in outs. All right, so the program structure. So here's your top level module, and then you're calling all these modules inside of that top level module. Now remember, they're not defined inside the top level module. They're, they're only called, and we call that calling an instantiation. And, we, and uh, we can instantiate them a whole bunch of times. You can think of this analogous to a function in C. Your main program is a top-level function, and then with with you don't define functions inside a main, but you can call functions inside a main, and functions can call functions, and functions can call other functions. Uh, so they are very similar to functions. However, within Verilog we do have a thing called a function, so don't confuse modules with functions uh, within Verilog because we have modules and we have functions in Verilog. In C we don't have that. We just have functions. Uh, all right. So here here's an example of a full adder. So this is a this is a great example of a module. And then we're going to show you how we can use this to create uh, take instantiate several copies of the one bit adder and make a four bit adder. All right. So um, so here's the here are the defining equations for an adder. The sum is x, y, and c in exclusively or together, and c out is x and with y, y and with c in, and x and with c in, and those three AND gates, the outputs of those three AND gates or together. That's c out. So you have a, you have one input x, one input y, one input carry in, and you have one output sum and one output carry out. So you can add three bits and you get uh, two bits out. All right, if they're all ones, you get three, so C out would be one and the sum would be one. You'd have a carry out and your sum would be one. All right, so how, do, how would we do this? Well, so this would look like this. We have a, uh, a module, uh, keyword, and then we have the name, full adder, again, no spaces. What are our signals? X y, carry in, carry out, and sum. So we're going to add one bit of x, one bit of y, one bit of carry in, and we're going to generate a sum and a one bit of carry out. So notice we put the signals here and then we declare them as outputs and inputs here. We would also declare them as registers if any of them were, but in this case they're all wires. So we, we could put the wire designation here, but they left it out on this slide. So it's assumed. But you uh, but you never assume the register if, if it's not specified as a wire. All right, 
So C out and sum are our outputs, X, Y, and C in are our inputs. And then here's our assigned statement. Notice we did put in a, uh, uh, an, an inertial delay of 10 nanoseconds, assuming that our uh, boilerplate at the beginning of our uh, file uh, specifies a time scale of, of nanoseconds. And uh, so this is 10 nanoseconds. And sum equals X exclusive ORD with Y exclusive OR with carry in. Notice there is no such thing as a logical exclusive OR. It always is. It has to be a bitwise exclusive OR uh, because a logical exclusive OR makes no sense. Um, you can't logically exclusive OR uh, two vectors. It does not work. Um, well, I guess you could, but anyway, nobody does. And, uh, and then we have uh, uh, here we have X and Y. Again, all these are bits. Again, we didn't specify any vectors here. So uh, this is X, and it, you could have a single ampersand here. It would be just as legal. You could have a single bar here. It, all these could be single operators, indicating bitwise. But because they're bits, they, they can also be logical operators. So who, know, who knows what the right thing to do there is. All right. Anyway, um, so this is your, these are your defining equations. And that's going to generate your sum and your carry out. And they're both assigned a prop an, in an inertial delay or a propagation delay of 10 nanoseconds and module. OK, now uh, we're going to do a 4-bit adder. With the 4-bit adder, we're going, to, uh, we're going to connect a bunch of these 1-bit adders. And so we're going, to have, we're going to have a module. And we're going to call it, uh, we're going to call it, um, uh, 4-bit adder, I guess. So we'll have to put in an underscore here because we not a lot of spaces. And then, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll show you the, the very low code here in a minute, but this is the sort of the, uh, the block diagram. So our top level module would be this whole thing. Someplace else we would define our full adder and then we would instantiate one, two, three, four copies of it. We would also have to declare some internal signals, C1, C2, and C3. And then we, our port list, though, would be four bits of sum, four bits of A, four bits of B, a single bit of carry in, and a single bit of carry out. And that's how that would look. So let's look at our code. And uh, so here's our code. And we have, um, we have, uh, so we have a sum. So here, so this is the top level module. So we have the name, adder four, keyword module, name adder four. Then we have our signal list, S, carry out, A, B, and carry in. Now notice we don't specify here that S, A, and B are vectors and that C0 and C in uh, or CI are single bits, but here we do. So output three to zero sum, output carry out single bit, input three to zero A and B, and input single bit carry in. Again, we didn't specify registers, so these are all wires. And then we define our internal signal, C, as a wire. And we define it as 3 to 1. So we're going to have C1, C2, and C3. There will be no C0 uh, that exists. Um, C0 would just be the carry in, the initial carry in here. And uh, the last carry out will be C0. But the reason we don't. Uh, include that here is because uh, th these internal signals will not show up in the outside world. Uh, we don't need to see them. We don't need to have them. All right. Now, notice down here, uh, we take the definition that we made of our full adder back here. Well, no, sorry, we didn't do it here. Uh, here, we take this, this module, which we defined uh, in the same file, but not within the top level module. We take that same uh, module, and we uh, and here we instantiate it. We instantiate it four copies of it, um, and these copies are each copy each instantiation. We just list the name of our one bit adder, which in this case is full adder, but we have to give it a unique instance name. So that can be anything. It could, it could be one two three four. In this case, they used uh, FA0, FA1, FA2, and FA3. 
you usually should you don't want these to be unduly long but you do want you 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 should make it something that will kind of remind people what what it is this um the only time we really use this is when we uh, have a, a, a deaf palm uh, statement. And in that case, and maybe a couple other cases, we, we can actually reach into this top level module and reference one of these installate one of these instances and change things in this instance if we want with a completely external um, uh, state, you know, essentially uh, synthesizer directive, if you will. Okay, so there, now notice how this works. The first full adder, which is this one, the signals it gets are A0, B0, and carry in CI, and it generates S0 and C1. So notice A0, B0, carry in, and then it's going to generate the carry out, which is going to be C1 right here, and it's going to have the carry in, which is, uh, sorry, it's, and it's going to have some S0 up here. All right. Notice this inst instantiation is going to be this full adder, and it's going to have A1 and B1. That's pretty obvious. A0, B0, A1, B1, A2, B2, A2, A3, B3. But it's going to have its carry in is going to be that internal signal C1 right here. Its output is going to be the internal signal C2, its carry out, and its sum is just going to be S1. So C in is C1, C out is C2, and the sum is S1. This one has A2, B2, and S2. That's all pretty obvious. But the carry signals, you have to kind of pay attention here. The carry in is C2, and the carry out is C3. And the final one, A3, B3, generating S3 with a carry in of C3, but a carry out of C0, because it's the final carry out which does appear in this external uh, port list. So you can see this adder, uh, well, all of these touch signals that are, that are in the port list, but they're supplied to this called module in, in, it, in where it's instantiated within the top level module. Okay, um, and then end module. So this would be a complete uh, Verilog system. Not a very complicated one, just a four bit adder using four copies of a uh, single bit adder. Now, let me just say at this point, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just interrupt the flow of the slides here briefly because I, I wanna show you something that's kind of interesting. Sorry, this is screwy. Um, okay, let me change cameras here just a bit. And we'll go back over here. What I want you to see, um, if I can draw it, um, let's see. Now, this is certainly a completely legitimate way to to do to create a four-bit adder. But you could do this in the top-level module. Uh, all all you would have to all you would have to do you can actually write it as simply as uh, sum, well, you could write carry out uh, concatenated with um, uh, A0 plus, or sorry, A, A plus B plus carry in. That's all you'd have to write. That would do the same thing. A lot less writing. And that's one of the beauties of, of Verilog is that we can write top level descriptions like this and we don't have to, uh, we don't have to go through uh, all the details of specifying the hardware and the gates and all that. So uh, sometimes we need to do that, but often we don't. And so when we don't need to do that, um, we probably shouldn't because it just makes more work. So. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it's, it's very, very powerful. The synthesizer is smart enough to take that top level description and produce the same hardware that you would get with your lower level description. And uh, it, it's even smarter than that because 
with the top level description, you you might not get a carry ripple adder. You you, uh, you might very well get a carry look ahead or a more optimized uh, piece of hardware. Whereas if you did the bottom, if you did the the example in the slides, you're going to get a carry ripple adder because that's what you designed. Uh, so sometimes it's not in your interest to do all this extra work. Okay, so let me shrink this back down. All right, so this is fine, totally legal, but this is actually probably not how you would normally uh, do an adder, although we're going to do this, uh, just because it's great, it's great practice. But the truth is, most of the time we, we're going to avoid this. And uh, so we instantiate this four copies. There's one other thing that you need to know. We notice how in our, uh, I'm not going to go back to it, but our original full adder port list looked like this, right? The one bit adder, X, Y, carry in, carry out some. Notice we've put the signals in the exact right order that our original definition had them. And this is called positional notation. We don't have to do it that way. We can use another uh, syntax called the dot notation where we can mix them around, but then we have to, we have to use diff slightly different syntax to make that legal. If you, if you switched A and B here, uh, I guess it would still work okay, but it, well, if you switched the carry in and the carry out, it would definitely screw things up uh, because this is an input and that's an output. And so that would really be, that would be goofy uh, because the, yeah. So anyway, the, the C1 gets its, uh, gets its value from this instantiation and C2 gets its value from this instantiation and so forth. So if you don't, if you didn't have these correct, like if C1 were here instead, making it an input, you'd have it an input here and an input here. C1 would never be driven by anything and therefore it would be an unknown value and it would screw everything up. So it's very important to get the wires hooked up correctly. Uh, again, wires, um, wires don't, uh, wires don't, uh, they don't hold values. They have to be driven by something. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so this is what the, the dot notation would look like if you use that. And we'll come back and talk about that. But you put a little dot in front of the original signal. Uh, here's the original signal. X, Y, carry in, carry out sum. So you'd have to do dot X, and then you put your new signal in parentheses. Dot Y, your new signal and then dot carry in your new signal, dot C out, dot sum. And uh, in this case, the order doesn't matter. You could, these can be in any order you want, as long as you separate them by commas and put the dots, the dot X, dot Y, dot carry in, dot carry out, and dot sum, and put the signals that you're actually putting in, in parentheses. This is a little uh, easier to read, but it, you can make a mistake with this if you get anything out of order. So. We will mostly use the positional notation, but if you want to use the named association, or I call it the dot, the dot, uh, the dot syntax, you can do that. All right. Um, what about what about in out signals? Um, so this is uh, this is an example uh, of another module, and so it's gonna it's gonna have uh, gates is the name of the module. And the uh, keyword module, name of the module, gates, could be capitalized. It, they just happen to make it all lowercase. The signals are coming in, AB, or the signals that connect to the outside world, A, B, C, D, E. Looking at this, you don't know what's inputs and what's outputs, but here you do know uh, this: the A, B, C are inputs and the D and E are outputs. And then here, are, here they are. D is A ordered with B, and E is C ordered with D. Two statements. They're both uh, assigned continuous assignment statements, and they have uh, a five nanosecond delay and module. All right, now, um, so what's what? Why is there? Why is this controversial? Well, it's controversial because uh, D is a input to this gate, but it's an output to that gate. And actually, we saw this in one of our other slides. Will this work? Is this a problem? Can can we 
how should we specify D? Well, we obviously, if we want to be, if we want the outside world to ever see D, then we have to, uh, it has to be included up here. And so how should we include it? Should we include it as an input? Or we should be included as an output? And since we had A and B generating D, and then uh, D going into uh, E here, uh, connecting it to the outside world is kind of could be kind of tricky because uh, because A and B would define D, and yet you know connecting it to the outside world, we could put a value in for D that might not agree with what A and B would produce. So that that creates some confusion here. All right. So what what will happen with that? And uh, so uh, in Verilog, you can, you can do this. It will allow it because this, the synthesizer sort of uh, kind of thinks it knows what you probably intend, and it'll fix it. Whereas in VHDL, this is completely illegal. Can't do it. Um, so uh, so uh, if, if other modules are going to use D as an input, uh, to this module, then um, then D needs to be specified as an in out, as opposed to just an input. But I, I think this is this this gets dangerous. And remember, one of the things going on here is these is st these statements are continuously being executed. So if you change D, you're not going to cause this line to execute, but you are going to cause this line. But if you change B. Then you're going to redefine D again. So if you if you make D an input and an output, and you change it to some other module, you change E. But if you change B, you'll change D again. And it'll go back. It'll it'll assume the new value, which will then cause this to be recomputed. So if so if you think someplace you're changing D, and someplace else you're changing B, you're going to potentially set up. Uh, a situation where you may not know what the actual value of D is, uh, which means you may not actually know what the value of E is. Uh, at any given instant, there may be a, 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 a fight. And that would be the exact same thing if you hooked these gates up, but you had an external way of overriding D. So you can see it's, it's a little problematic. Uh, you generally don't want to do stuff like this. Uh, okay. Okay, so here we have in out. So, uh, so if you're actually going to send the value d in, uh, then you really do need to uh, use it as an input output. You need to specify it as an in out. Again, this this is tricky programming, and you if you find yourself trying to do something like this you're probably making a mistake logically uh, in the way you're constructing the problem. So I, you know, I don't think this generally is the way you want to go, uh, especially with continuous assignment statements. Uh, it's a little different when you have always blocks and you have them synchronized with clocks. You have a little more leeway uh, because you can change things between clock pulses potentially. But here, you're, you're really, uh, you can get yourself into trouble if someplace else you're changing A and B, and someplace else you're trying to drive D. Uh, so that's going to be problematic. Okay. Okay, so let's go on. Um, oops, I didn't want to do that. I want to go here and do that. Okay. So in Verilog, we have two general types of assignments. We have, uh, and it's just like when we took logic design. You have two types of, of networks, okay? You have combinational logic and you have sequential logic. And we have two different types of assignments. We have combinational assignments and we have sequential. In Verilog, we call them continuous assignments for the combinational stuff and procedural assignments for the sequential stuff. So these, you'll see these names uh, mixed around. So just remember, if, if you have an assignment where, where there's 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 no clock uh, and there's no uh, conditions sort of uh, for when it's when it executes and when it doesn't, 
If it, only, if it always executes whenever the right side changes, then it's a continual assignment. It's just exactly the same as, as the paradigm uh, where we have, let's see, let me pop this over here. In, in, our standard, uh, in our standard world where we have where we have um, our, our, our black box, say A and B, and then output C. In the combinational world, all C depends on is the current values of A and B. But in the sequential world, it depends on the state that our, that our logic circuit is in. And that requires some memory. And almost always a clock. So not always, but almost always. So, so that's the difference. And we, have, we call these, if it involves a clock and some memory, we call these procedural statements, procedural assignments. And, and if, uh, and if it's a, and if it is a, um, uh, just purely combinational, then we call these uh, continuous assignments. Procedural assignments and continuous assignments. And the procedural assignments uh, generally show up in what are called either initial blocks or always blocks. In, if you're making an integrated circuit, initial blocks don't really work that well. <laughs> but uh, when you have an FPGA, they do. So for our purposes, we can use initial blocks. But, uh, but normally, we're, normally we're kind of constrained. And, and we really uh, we find ourselves where we really, um, uh, uh, if you're actually making a chip, then you can only use always blocks. You really you can't use initial blocks. You can only use those in your test bench simulations. All right, um, let me switch back. All right, and we'll move this over here. Okay, so this is really important to know, and um, and it turns out within uh, procedural blocks, uh, the rules are totally different. Whereas our continuous assignment statements, the rules are very clear cut, but in procedural blocks, it, you, it, there's a little confusion. So there's a lot of confusion in this area because of the loose syntax allowed. This is one of the, this is one of the things with Verilog that's um, both a, a good and a bad. Verilog is, is loosey-goosey with its syntax. It allows you to do things that, that VHDL does not allow. Uh, VHDL is very, very uh, stringent in its syntax, but Verilog is very loose in it. And so Verilog will let you use an always block that doesn't result in an always block or that doesn't result in a, in a sequential logic. And why they do that is beyond me. Uh, I guess it's kind of convenient. I don't know. It's, it's very sloppy, clearly. But, uh, but it's used all the time. And uh, part of it is because it lets you use things like if statements and uh, switch statements that you're not allowed to use in continuous assignment statements, but if you use them in a the proper way, in a in in an always block, they will still wind up synthesizing as combinational logic and not as sequential logic like you would expect. But most of the time, I mean, if you use an always block the way it's really intended, then you would you would always use it in such a way that it would synthesize as sequential logic, right? But Verilog allows you to 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 use it. To, de to describe combinational logic using the, uh, the, the, the terms and tools of sequential logic, I, which I, I find a little off-putting, but, um, but perhaps you won't, perhaps you'll think that's great. Anyway, since it's more popular in the US than, uh, than, very, than VHDL, it kind of speaks to, the, to our personality in the United States where we, we, we kind of, we are a little bit more free spirited, spirited than a lot of cultures, uh, particularly than uh, well, than, than a lot of cultures. And uh, so a loosey goosey uh, syntax uh, hardware description language seems to fit our nature better 
Perhaps that's why VHDL is more often used in Europe. And I don't know about Asia, which one they use more. I wouldn't be surprised that it's a VHDL. But anyway, uh, okay. So remember the terms, sequential and procedural, same, same. Combinational and continuous, same, same. You can use procedural blocks to write continuous assignments, but I don't recommend it, but you can do it. Some operators are only legal in procedural blocks. Uh, and there are only two types of procedural blocks, initial blocks and always blocks. Let me just say this now. We'll come. We're, you're going to get this multiple times, but, uh, but this is your first exposure, so I'll say it now since we're looking at initial and always blocks. Initial blocks execute when, uh, when power is applied to the device. Always blocks are triggered, uh, and they, they typically execute once and then never again. Always blocks are, are triggered by s when the signals in their sensitivity list change. And maybe you remember that from logic design where we talked about in procedural blocks that there's a sensitivity list. And that sensitivity list, all the signals that trigger the execution of that sequential block. In this case, always block. Um, in, a, in VHDL, we call that a procedural block, I think. Um, okay. So continuous assignment. This I mentioned this already, and I, I I don't even know why they talk about this, but but you have an explicit continuous assignment where you use the keyword assign as like this y or c assign c equals a or b, and you 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 can also have an implicit continuous assignment where you you just don't use the keyword. I, I I don't see the use of this. I mean, I don't see why why the language would allow this, but they do. Uh, it, it's a little bit confusing, but you kind of soon ignore it. So you may or may not see the word assign. That's really what it comes down to. And you can you can define the wire like this, but you don't even have to do that. You could still do wire C, and then you could write C equals A or with B without the assign word. So you basically what it's basically telling you you don't have to use the assign word. And you could also write wire assign C equals A or B, I think. I think that's legal too. So the syntax is just loosey-goosey with Verilog. And I guess I guess a lot of people like that. Okay, procedural assignments. So synchronous sequential logic blocks respond to changes dependent on the clock usually, although it does although they don't have to have a clock. They can have uh, they can be dependent on a on a on a on a signal, uh, and when the signal changes, it will execute it. But most of the time, many the vast majority of always blocks probably involve clocks. But they but any signal can be used to trigger the execution, and and they also oftentimes have other signals like reset, and uh, clear, and set and things like that. So modeling sequential logic requires primitives to model selective activity conditional on clock, edge trigger devices, our sequence of operations, etc., etc. And there are a number of syntactic complications. So let's look at this. Um, so again, two types of procedural blocks. Initial blocks execute only once at time zero. So when you fire up your device, this is that so <coughs> when they talk about time zero, they're talking about simulation. But but they and, and for integrated circuits, they're only useful in simulation uh, because, well, because you don't really get the, the privilege. When you power up an integrated circuit, essentially most of the internal stuff comes up in random values. Now you can build initializing circuitry into an, an a, uh, integrated circuit, but that, that has to be done explicitly. Um, but, a, but, a, but a FPGA is a little different you program an FPGA with a bit file. So when you power it up, you start in a known condition defined by your bit file. This is not true with an integrated circuit. An integrated circuit just has gates and stuff in it, and when you power it up, they assume random values. But you can have a, uh, a pin that, say, has a capacitor on it, and, uh, and while that pin is, is held low until the capacitor charges, then there, there can be circuitry that runs that sets a whole bunch of initial values on things. 
and and that often that's what has to be done to correctly initialize an integrated circuit. So, but these are, you can write a book about initializing circuits for ICs. Uh, but in FPGA, you have the tremendous advantage of, of being able to initialize things with the the bit file you program into it. So in, in an FPGA, when you're writing a very log for that, you you can definitely use initial blocks, and they will they can they can initialize the value of variables. It's a really nice feature. It's not available to you in when you're designing a uh, integrated circuit. There you would have to create circuitry to specifically do that, and it's it's a hassle. It's a real hassle. Uh, so uh, so that's another advantage of FPGAs uh, we normally don't even talk about. Um, Initial blocks are also used extensively in test benches for simulation. And when you're making an integrated circuit, you still use initial blocks, but they're used only in the test benches, essentially. So you, you don't really put them into the code that's going to get uh, turned into the integrated circuit. You just put them into the test bench code uh, that's going to simulate the integrated circuit. Um, OK, so again, not, not useful for a, a application specific integrated circuit or just a de novo integrated circuit because that initial state is not fixed. Now you now like I said you can create hardware to to set up that initial state but that is uh, but that's above and beyond uh, the call of duty. Okay the other type of procedural assignment is the always block and we use uh, lots and lots of always blocks. Always blocks loop or execute over and over again and they may execute at time zero they uh, where they can kind of get in a race with initial conditions, so you always have to be a little bit careful about that. The always block waits for the event in its sensitivity list, whereas an initial block is just executed uh, at the very beginning without any waiting. Okay, now you, in a test bench, you can have initial blocks that are spaced out with specified time delays, so that they 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 can uh, they can execute. They don't necessarily execute at the very beginning. They can be in a test bench, they can be set up to execute at various time intervals. Uh, also a little confusing, but that's not uh, something you can do generally in, in, your, uh, in, your, in your actual code that you're going to, in your top, in your, in your actual modules. Okay, um, I think here's the syntax, and I'm going to quit with this. So uh, these are initial statements. You just have the keyword initial begin and end, and you put sequential statements in here. The always block, you have a sensitivity, you have the at sign, and then in parentheses, your sensitivity list. Now, let me just say this right now, we'll come back to it many times. The sensitivity list in an always block can have level signals, but if it has level signals, the assumption is that you're not going to use it as an always block, that you're making you're kind of using it in the bastardized mode to make combinational logic, like I said earlier, is allowed. But if you have edge signals, then we normally think, okay, then that means you're going to use it as an, a sequential uh, to, to actually have uh, generate sequential code. Okay, so or sequential hardware. So uh, so because of this, your sensitivity list cannot mix level signals and edge signals together. They have to all be either level signals, suggesting that you're probably making a combinational logic block, just using the always block to do it, or they can be edge signals, which definitely suggest you're, you're making sequential logic. And then you have a begin and end statement, and in between those you have your sequential statements. So that's how, that's how it goes down. Notice in Verilog, we mostly replace the brackets in C with begin and end statements. And that's that's true pretty much everywhere. So in C, when you would normally think you'd use brackets, in Verilog you would use begin and end. Uh, arguably, uh, it's a little more wordy, but it's a little less confusing, fr confusing frankly. Uh, it's harder to miss a one of these keywords than it is to miss a bracket. It's easy to miss a bracket. All right, I'm going to stop there. Uh, it, come by, come by the lab at 10 o'clock, or the I think we'll be, I don't know, atrium. Probably come by the atrium is where we'll have the boards. Uh, track me down, and I will sign out a board to you. And uh, 
and uh, I again I'll be around I'll be around for sh sure from 10 a.m. Friday morning until early afternoon maybe one or two. All right, uh, that should do it. We will stop with that.